Hey guys, and welcome back to my channel. So today we have a whole thin crust pizza and some homemade fried pickles, some ranch, and then some pickled jalapenos. I also have a water. Um, yeah, so grab a snack and let's get started. I'm gonna start with the pizza because I'm starving. Today, I really did not feel like going to the gym. But I went. So I'm proud of myself for that. Because I really didn't want to. But I still went. I just wanted to eat this. This is all I've been thinking about all day. Okay, so today. I'm super laid back because. It's like a really rainy day and it never rains here in Texas so that's like awesome. So I just stayed in my PJs after I got ready. <laughs> but today I wanted to talk about a really famous uh, can Canadian uh, case. Now. How many of y'all love to go camping? Because after this, you're not going to want to go camping anymore. <laughs> this is the case that is known as the Wells Gray's murder. Um, or the Wells Gray Park murders. It is a case about how three generations were gone within a blink of an eye due to one person. August 2nd, 1982. Bob and Jackie John Johnson, they decided that they wanted to take their kids and their parents or I can't remember which side the grandparents were on, but the grandparents, the parent, and then the grand, and then the grandchildren went. So there was, so there was Bob and Jackie, and they had a, had daughters Janet and Karen. Um, Janet was eleven, Karen was thirteen. And then also the grandparents George and Edith tagged along too. Now August sixth will be the last time anyone hears anything from the family. And then, on August 16th, Bob fails to go to work. Which is really unusual because he's very uh, punctual about things like work. So, his work thinks it's really weird. They can't get a hold of him. A week later, they're finally reported as officially missing to the police. Now, the RCMP gets very involved and they're like, okay, we need to find them. So, a search ensues. And they can't find them anywhere. Can't find the two cars because there was one car. And then the grandparents had a truck that had a camper attached to the bed of it and then also had a boat on top of the um, camper. Until September 13th, so about a month later basically. A mushroom picker is out there in the mountains. He stumbles upon a car that has been burned severely. It was so good. So he calls the cops. They show up. It was not looking too good.
They look in and they find skeletal remains. Now at this point too, they realize that the truck with the camper is still missing. So they're like, okay, so this is obviously a robbery or something like along those lines. So they're like, posting all of the news. If you've seen this RV or this truck, or not this RV, this camper, attached to this truck or this truck by itself, let us know. And the lead officer on this case, Mike, he was telling his story about how when he saw the girls initially, they weren't in the car. Well, they were in the car, but they were in the trunk. So the case goes cold, unfortunately. But that's another thing, too. This family is very experienced in camping. This is not new, so they know that it's not that they got lost or got hurt or whatever. This is probably foul play. Especially, too, because when they were in the car, searching the car, they did find that the skeletal remains did have a, a 22 caliber uh, gunshot wounds. And so spring of 1983, the cops had to get really creative because you know once you hit a, a dead end on a cold case and especially since it's six people that were found murdered. Um, one person being mur murdered is important, but six people, three generations just gone like that is pretty important. So in April, they broadcast a show that reenacts the crime or how they think the crime took place. So it can jog people's memories because also, like I said, they were experience so one of the things that is kind of negative with them being experienced is that they never uh camped near other campsites they always camped pretty remotely in these parks and then in may since they still have not found the uh, truck or camper authorities at this point have gotten tons of leads saying oh i saw them in quebec i saw them over here i saw them in ontario so what they did is they noticed that I kind of like made a line in a way, almost like a road trip. So they decided let's do the road trip with the same exact replica of that uh, truck camper and the boat hooked onto the top and see if that can help jog people's memories also. At one point they had thought they had a really credible lead. I believe it was a waitress, she said that she had a man and woman come in and they drove the exact same truck. So they brought in a sketch artist and of course instantly those photos were plastered everywhere nationwide. Oh no. <clears throat> and then we had another lead from a mechanic. And this mechanic said, you know, I had this one guy come in. Right before he came in, he unattached the camper from the truck. And he asked me to repair the truck for him, but also he asked me to get rid of a gun. But I said no. So he left. So now the cops are thinking, oh man, like... He got, he's like getting rid of the gun, you know, he's trying to get rid of all this stuff, you know, we need to really catch him. So by this time, it's been almost a year, because now it's Canada Day, and Canada Day, don't get mad at me, Canadians. I think it's like July 1st, I know, or it's like June 30th. I know it's very close to 
July 4th. Mike, the head of this case, is just on a wild goose chase, just chasing any lead he can have. By the end, they ended up having over 13,000 tips once this case was said and done. That's a lot of tips that you have to go through. And he wasn't half-assing it either. He was like, if we got a tip, we thoroughly looked through it. So at this point, it's about October now, so it's been a few months still kind of chasing leads, chasing this, chasing whatever. And he gets this call and they're like, hey, I know that this, bit, this tr uh, truck is traveling into the U.S. right now. They're going to Detroit. So now, Mike is like all cracked because now this case has just went to a whole nother level. Because now he is crossing not just like county lines or whatever or province lines, he is crossing country lines now. And also too, this case is back in the 80s, so back then I had, I don't think Border Patrol was like how it is now. I, I don't think you would be able to get through in present day, you know? So Mike is like, you know, I've been on this chase for a whole, almost a, um, a little over a year now. I am tired of trying to catch this stupid guy. So he was like, you know what? Screw it. I'm not gonna wait for all these little blase blase things that you have to do to like, uh, to work with like the other countries, uh, like our FBI or our police officers. So he just flies on down there. I believe he took like a helicopter. And so he's down there, ready. He's like, I'm gonna get this dude. Like, I'm gonna get surprised, mother. But no. He gets a call, right? And they're like, hey, we found the truck. And it has the camper. And he's like, no, no you didn't. I'm here in Detroit, I'm waiting for it to come in. Like, you're supposed to be driving in any minute. I know, dude. You gotta come back. So he flies back. And they're happy to find the camper. And the truck. The thing that they're pissed off about is that it is extremely close to the murder site or no it is uh, extremely close to where the car was found or it was like in the same like park basically um they do figure out that that is probably the main murder site because they do find shell casings there is bullet holes in the door of the truck And the boat's missing. <laughs> this was on October 18th. The car was found on Battle Mountain. The truck and camper was found on Trophy Mountain. The family was murdered at Bear Creek. Now. Now that we have that correlation, so. Trophy Mountain is where the truck is found and the camper's found. 
Um, Battle Mountain is where the car was found with all the bodies. Bear Creek is where they were camping. So now by this time, Mike and them are like, you know what, this has to be a local because it just has to be. So I'm assuming that this is a really small town because in us or like in Texas here, like they would never, like never, <laughs> they go door to door to every resident and knock on the door and question every single resident. probably like a thousand maybe a couple thousand people that live there maybe now i get to this one house very strange knock on the door this dude answers he's pretty rude whatever you know people are rude his wife comes out to the front porch and she wants to know what's going on. And he tells her, get back inside. You don't, you don't, it's nothing pertaining to you. And the officer goes, no, actually, like, I don't want to ask you both. Like, have y'all seen anything suspicious? Have y'all heard anything? You know, the whole rundown. And he's like, no. And she's, he's like, well, what about you, miss? She's like, and he goes, she, she doesn't know anything either. She hasn't seen anything. And then the wife... I don't know if she purposely did this. She probably did. And it was just good that the officer was smart enough to catch on. She goes. But honey, do you think this has anything to do with David? And he instantly like was like, shut up, shut up, go inside. Pushes her inside. And so the officer's like, okay, you know, thank you for your time, whatever. Bye, have a great day. Enjoy your day, you know. But the officer is like, I ain't stupid. So he drives away, but then pulls to where they can't see him. So he acts like he leaves, but he really didn't leave. He waits for the husband to leave. Then once the husband leaves, he walks on up, he goes, you know, and asks the wife. And the wife says, well, uh, like, I know someone named David who's acting kind of weird and blah, 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 whatever. And so they're like, okay. So they bring David in for questioning. And of course, he's like poker face, kind of like kind of standoffish. So by now, so by now it's November 19th is when they are bringing Mike in for, or Mike in for David in for questioning. So his name is David, Sh David Shearing. So they bring him in, he's not talking, and Mike is like, I gotta get through to him. So Mike like offers him a cigarette, just kind of talking, you know, whatever. And uh, Mike is like, so do you like fishing? And he's like, yeah, I, got, I, I like fishing. You ever do any hunting out here? You know, it's beautiful Canada, you know, brushery, you know? He's like, yeah, yeah, I got quite a few guns. I got a 22 caliber. Um, I have this one, I have this type of shotgun. It's like, okay. And that's when Mike is like, okay, strike one. You have the same gun that matches the murder weapon. Okay. And David's like, yeah, I live with my mom. I take care of her. And, you know, she means a lot to me. She doesn't know I'm here, right? He's like, no, she doesn't. So keep in mind, David's house is three miles from this murder site. So then finally the Mike is like, alright, enough BS and like, do you know why you're here? He's like, no, no I don't. Actually, I just, I want to just chit chat, you know. And Mike, which this isn't, this is just like a curveball for me. I was like, what? What? Whoa. Mike goes, so there was a teenage kid who was killed in the hit and run a few years ago. And David just like, 
like a weight lifted off of him and he's like oh, is this what we're here for he's like yeah he's like man it was an accident i'm so sorry like he was already drunk and passed out and it was too late by the time i hit him i was going to tell someone eventually you know like clear my conscience and so mike's like what what you know like what do you think your mom would be about this you know like if she heard about this and he was like she'd be sad he goes you know those murders those six murders those three generations gone within a night what did your mom think of that when she saw the news he was like man she was so sad yeah she was she was really torn up about it it's crazy mike shows him the photos of all the the whole family. Have you ever been um, over to Trophy Mountain? And Dave was like, oh, like I've worked over there before. Mike goes, what about the place where the, where the family was murdered? He goes, no, no, um, I've never been to Bear Creek. And he stops. So he realizes Bear Creek was never available to the public ever. So you had to have been there to know that information. So David goes, I think I'm gonna ask for my lawyer now. And Mike goes, yeah, I think you need a lawyer. So David ends up eventually pleading guilty to this. Cause obviously. Mike asks him, what made you do this? Why? Like." Three generations just gone. Children, gone. You know, they were 11 and 13. They had a whole life ahead of them. He goes, man, I just really wanted their stuff. I really wanted their camper. I wanted their boat. I took their boat and the motor. I took some power tools. He was like, I was gonna keep the truck. I was just gonna fix the bullet hole in the door. But then next thing I know, y'all had the photos just plastered everywhere. So I knew I had to get rid of it. So that's what I did. I got rid of it. And I got rid of them. He's like, okay. Well, he's pissed. Mike is pissed. He was like, you kill people for tools? For a boat? And it wasn't even a nice boat. Like, it was like, it looked almost like a kayak because it was over the top of the camper. Like, flipped upside down. So it was just like a couple hundred dollars worth of a boat. Nothing special. Nothing worth killing six people nothing nothing is worth killing six people now fast forward it's april 16th 1984. david shearing is sentenced to the uh harshest penalty he can serve for what he did so he pleads guilty to all six murders he was charged with sec second degree murder he was sentenced life in prison with uh and within 25 years he would be eligible to apply for parole Now, after his sentencing, Mike is like, I want to talk to him again. So Mike comes in the cell and he's like, look, you're already sentenced. So whatever you tell me right now doesn't really matter. It's not going to ruin your sentence. It's not going to do anything. Because you're already sentenced. That's what you got. But your motive is bullshit. Why would you kill six people for that? There has to be another reason. And David finally says, after Mike hounding him, because Mike was like, I'm not leaving the cell, boy, till you tell me what's up. So David says, well, he saw the girls. And he really wanted them. So he waited till nighttime while they were on the campfire. He killed the grandparents and the parents, but left the girls alive. He says he's not sure how long he kept them alive because it kind of blurred together for those days. I guess he was just having the time of his life being a predator. Um, but he spent about seven to ten days um, sexually assaulting them. And then once he was done, he decided to shoot them and then put them in the trunk. And then I guess that's when he did finally burn the car. Um, 
because when they did find all the bodies, they were all in like skeletons. Like there was no more um, flesh left, unfortunately. In September 2008, he was eligible for his first appeal of, of being like on parole. He was denied. The family went hard. Like the family went hard. Mike went hard. They all were like, he is not a fit. Like he has sexual fantasies. He never completed the sexual predator program that he's supposed to complete. He has done nothing to show that he has improved or changed as a person. He is a terrible person. He needs to stay in jail for the rest of his life. So I think it's like the national parole board um, granted that wish and um, agree that he should not be let out. And then in 2014, he applied again. And I, and then a month before the hearing, he withdrew. Um, so I think, I know with certain like crimes, you're only allowed to appeal your sentence so many times. I think it's like three or five times maybe. So maybe that's why he withdrew because he realized that maybe he didn't have enough like backing or whatever i mean there's really you you killed six people like i don't know what you expect like people to think of you and every few years the police that were involved including mike and the whole family they create petitions to um remind people how much of a monster he is because he is a monster um it's just cold blood murder really um they were just out camping and it's scary too because I went camping like last month and I just slept out in a hammock out in the open and I was terrified and I'm glad I, like I've known about this case but I never really looked into it. I'm glad I'm looking into it now. Um, I'm glad I didn't die when I decided just to sleep outside like that. So that's good. It's not scary. Um... Yeah, and Mike said that the rest of his, his, him being alive, he will advocate for David to stay in jail. Um, also, too, David changed his name. Sorry, you're still a predator, you're still a murderer, um, no matter how much you change your name. Um, he only, so, he kept his first name, which is David. So, now he is known as David Ennis or Ennis. I'm not sure how you say it. Um, don't really care. It doesn't really matter if you say it right or not because... You know. All right, guys. I hope you enjoyed today's mukbang and today's story. I hope y'all were eating with me. Um, I love eating snacks and watching YouTube videos, so I hope y'all did that too. Um, I'm gonna go and finish the rest of this in a few minutes. Um, yeah, but be sure to subscribe, like this video, comment down below. I love interacting with people. Follow me on all my social media platforms listed below. I even have an Etsy shop too where I make jewelry. Um, yeah, so I'll see y'all in the next video. Bye.